Welcome to part 2 of my workshop. I promised in workshop 1 that those of you who are not registered participants would get the solutions of the homework here in this second part. Registered participants who sent their um, suggestions to me got the right answers and some comments at once after sending their work to me. But I have decided to make a small change. This second part of my series of workshops about FM and PM is going to be a quite long one and I don't want to make it even longer. Therefore, you get the solutions of the homework not in but with today's workshop. With today's release of this part 2, you can watch and download the solutions on my website www.rowfilm-media.net. To ask and discuss questions about these solutions, or about the workshop in general, please use my forum at um, forum or use the comments here on YouTube, or send me an email at rowfilm at sesnam zz. Before I go into the matter, I'd like to thank composer and sound designer John Harrison. We communicated about this workshop and he sent me some pictures he had unearthed. The pictures are taken in the Burbank studios and show John Harrison and John Sutton working on the score of George Romero's Day of the Dead, using a lot of the X7. I'm going to analyze some of the patches they used in the score in a later workshop. Thank you, John, for these historical photos. Well, back to work. There are some more aspects of the envelopes we have to talk about. When you release a key or when a MIDI note off is sent from your door, all stages of the envelope, which may not have been played through yet, are skipped and the output level moves directly to level 4, mostly being adjusted at zero. It depends on rate 4 how fast level 4 is reached. As a result, long notes can have envelopes which are different from short notes. Next thing I want to show you is a kind of echo effect caused by the envelopes. To create this effect I decrease level 2 and choose a moderate rate 2, whereas level 3 and rate 3 have to be at high values. Rate 2 determines the time between the original sound and the echo. Level 3 determines the volume of the echo. If you want a note to start later than the MIDI note on signal is sent or a key is hit, you can set level 1 to a very low value and rate 1 to a value according to how long you want the delay to be. If you need a long delay, you should choose a level mm, of about 50, if uh, this is still under the level of audibility and leaves the attack a long time to get up to level 1. Lower levels shorten the attack time as we have discovered in workshop 1.
The last experiment with the envelopes mimics a classic ADSR envelope. Level 1 and 2 have to be at 99, high, and level 4 of course at 0. Rate 1 acts like a classic attack, rate 3 corresponds to a classic decay. Level 3 is the equivalent of a classic sustain level, and rate 4 acts as the classic release time. All right, the algorithms now. Implicitness first. An algorithm is nothing else than the way how the operators are arranged, determining which operator serves as a modulator and which as a carrier. Well, our real task reads, how can I find a system to choose the most appropriate algorithm for producing the sound I want to get out of DEX DX? or the DX7. Yamaha suggests to divide the 32 algorithms into four groups as they are drawn on the DX7. Algorithms 1 to 6 for piano and orchestral sounds as they offer two or three independent chains of modulation for creating different parts of the sound, as we did it in column 3 of workshop 1. Algorithms 7 to 18 for bass harps, stringed instruments and electric piano, as they can create the most complex harmonic spectra. Algorithms 19 to 25 for sounds with discrete attacks and for pipe organs, as they have a lot of carriers. And algorithms 26 to 32 for electric organs and simple wind instruments, as they are the least complex in harmonic structure but have a lot of carriers. Okay, these groups are surely somewhat helpful and give us a general orientation, but they don't offer a very sophisticated system considering the details of an algorithm. And what's more, even Yamaha's factory presets don't always follow these suggestions. Therefore, I use a different way of choosing an algorithm. There are five basic constellations occurring in the algorithms. Five constellations, each of which being typical for a special technique of modulation and offering special advantages and possibilities. In constellation 1 there are two or more independent chains of modulation being patched parallel to each other. In constellation 2 there are two or three modulators patched in series modulating a single carrier. In constellation 3 there is one modulator modulating two or more carriers. In constellation 4 there are two or more modulators modulating one single carrier. And at least constellation 5, well, this is the feedback loop containing one or more operators. algorithm is usually a combination of two or more of these basic constellations and sometimes the carrier of such a basic constellation is a modulator itself in the signal chain of modulation. I'm going to talk about the characteristics, the advantages and the usability of every of these five constellations in some minutes. But at first I want to show you a spreadsheet I have set up a spreadsheet containing the most important characteristics of every of the 32 algorithms, including the basic configurations CON1 to CON4, which they contain.
The feedback loop is mentioned in column D, showing how many operators the feedback loop includes. Column A shows how many independent parts, independent in spectral composition and independent in their progression in time, a sound can have. Columns B and C, maximal and minimal number of modulations in series, give information about the possible harmonic complexity the algorithm is able to create. Columns, uh, column E shows the number of carriers which are modulated by the same modulator, or in other words, how many carriers Constellation 3 does contain. The number 1 means, naturally, no Constellation 3, but a simple modulator carrier chain. Column F, is, uh, sorry, column F also describes Constellation 3, but this time the modulated operators are modulators as well. As you see, there is no algorithm with a number higher than 1. In other words, there is no algorithm with a constellation like shown in this graph. But as I'm going to use this spreadsheet not only with DX, but also with other FM soft synths, with more operators and no fixed pre-programmed algorithms later in this series of workshop one, uh, sorry, of this workshop, I have already included column F now and here. Columns G and H deal with constellation 4, but this time there is an algorithm with two modulators modulating an operator, which is a modulator itself. Column H shows it, it is algorithm 15. Please take care interpreting the graph of algorithm 15. It looks if the feedback loop clasped both modulation chains and if operator 5 modulated both operator 2 and operator 4. But indeed the feedback loop contains only operator 2 and operator 5 modulates only operator 4 together with operator 6. The last three columns, number of final carriers and how many of them are modulated and how many are not, are self-explanatory. Completely to the right you can see which constellations an algorithm contains. And for a quick but not so detailed overview you may find this schedule useful. Like always you can download all graphics and drafts and spreadsheets for free from my website www.rowfilm-medianet. It's time for a detailed look at the feedback loop and the four basic constellations now. Feedback first. When you look at the feedback loop, which contains only a single operator modulating itself, you may think, hmm, well, we have a carrier to modulate a ratio of 1 to 1. So we will get a saw wave, as we got one in workshop 1. So let me create the saw wave from workshop 1 again, using operators 1 and 2 from algorithm 1. I'll freeze the spectrum to compare. Now I switch to algorithm 32 and use only operator 6, increasing the amount of feedback. And with low amounts of feedback, we seem to be right. And even better, with a feedback knob at 5, we get a much better saw wave with the full spectrum of harmonics than we had in workshop 1. Do you remember? I promised a better saw wave in workshop 1, and here it is. When I increase the amount of feedback even more, to 6 and to 7, the operator runs wild creating a resonance peak at 6 and then, at a feedback amount of 7, we get a kind of pink noise. Well, it's feedback. Our first idea of a more or less simple one-to-one -one ratio was wrong in that not only the fundamental is feedback, but also every created partial. 
That leads with low and middle amounts of feedback to the nice saw wave we have seen. As the partials are weaker, the higher their frequency is, the modulation of a lower partial by a higher one is weak as well, as long as the amount of feedback isn't very high. But nevertheless, we must be aware of the fact that in a feedback loop every frequency, not only the fundamental, modulates every of the other frequencies and itself. The whole spectrum, every partial which is fed back, modulates every partial which is actually produced by the operator, thus producing more and higher partials again and so on and so on and so on. We have a whole bunch of modulator to carrier ratios, therefore, and with a higher amount of feedback, even the weak high frequency partials come into effect. Let's have a look at the feedback loop in action in a real preset. I load the preset strings 3 from the factory preset ROM cartridge 1A. The preset uses algorithm 15. At first, I just turn the amount of feedback up and down. The feedback influences the sound of the scratching of the virtual bow across the string. I switch the second chain of modulations, operators 5, 6, 4 and 3 off by simply turning the output of operator 3 down to get a clearer impression of the feedback's influence. You may shout out, hey, the feedback knob is at 7, the highest amount, but there is no noise. It is still a quite gentle sound coming out of the modulation chain. Well, yes, it is, because the output of operator 2, the operator with a feedback uh, loop, is not at the full 99, but only at 86. Of course, does the effect of feedback not only depend on the amount of feedback adjusted by the feedback knob, but also on the whole output of the operator in the feedback loop. So, let me change the output of operator 2 at last. Well, what about a feedback loop covering more than only one oscillator? For example, the loop in algorithm 4. Of course, we understand that the strength of the feedback effect depends on three factors now. A general, uh, sorry, the general amount of feedback determined by the feedback knob and the output levels of oscillators 6, 5 and 4. But it seems that the influence of the output levels of the three included operators is different with each operator. By the way, have you noticed that nice low fee tape noise effect when I turn the output of operator 6 up to about 99 and the output of operator 5 down to about 25? I want to proceed systematically. Therefore, I turn the feedback knob up to 7 and turn the outputs of the operators 6 and 5 gradually down, 
starting with operator 6 and then doing the same with operator 5. What at all are we investigating in? Well, we have a combination of two basic constellations, feedback plus constellation 2, more operators in series. As high order modulators, modulator 6 is a modulator of second order because it modulates an operator, which is a modulator itself, tends to produce partials at the higher end of the spectrum, its influence on the noise aspect of the sound is higher than that of operator 5. Turning down the output level of operator 6 makes the noise already vanish at high levels, whereas the influence of operator 5 on the noise aspect is remarkably lower, and even with quite low output levels of operator 5 we get noise as long as operator 6 is turned up. And we must not forget, turning operator 6 down also means reducing the modulation of operator 5, but turning operator 5 down means reducing the whole modulation of operator 4, the final carrier, including the part operator 6 contributes. This last aspect is more remarkable with lower amounts of feedback, of course. Let me reduce the feedback, therefore, and repeat the last experiment. With the last experiment I have crossed the border from the basic constellation feedback loop to the basic constellation 2, more operators in series. But let me return to feedback once more. I'm going to increase the amount of feedback gradually while the output levels of operators 5 and 6 are at maximum. In most of the factory presets, the feedback loops containing more than one operator don't have a significant influence on the sound. They are more like the last 5% to make it perfect. Let me just show the preset Clavinet 2 of ROM cartridge 1B. Again, I switch operator 1 off to demonstrate only the modulation chain in the feedback loop.
You see and hear the feedback loop's influence is marginal. Of course it is, as the output level of operator 6 is only at 78. Well, there is another aspect we will deal with later, key velocity. With higher velocities the difference is bigger, at least a little. But more about that later. Let me leave feedback and come to Constellation 2 with more than one modulator in series. I'm not going to talk about Constellation 1 today as we have dealt with it in the last workshop, even if I didn't call it Constellation 1 there. We are not in column 2, the theory part of this workshop, so let me choose a mere experimental approach to Constellation 2. I choose algorithm 1, turn the level of operator 2 completely down and use only the modulation chain operators 6, 5, 4 and 3. Popping up the volume of operator 3 to 99 and turning the level of operator 4 up to a moderate 66 or 67 results in the saw wave-like sound we know already from workshop 1. Well, of course. The frequency ratio of operator 3 and 4 is 1 to 1. I turn the level of operator 5 up now and again to a moderate 66 or 67. The result is an even better saw wave, brighter with more harmonics. Well, operator 6 now, up to level 66, 67 and once again, more harmonics, brighter sound, better saw wave. Let me repeat the experiment showing the three spectra top down. All carrier to modulator ratios are one to one, and with every operator stepping in, the spectrum widens, adding the next couple of harmonics, expanding to higher frequencies. I try the same again, but with a ratio of one to two this time, with a square wave, therefore. And, indeed, the sound gets brighter, the spectrum gets more and more higher partials when I activate one operator after the other. But the spectrum is somewhat strange with every second partial lower than it should. And the wave is a queer kind of a square wave. I've tried a carrier to modulator ratio of 1 to 2 with all carrier modulator pairs operators 3 and 4, operators 4 and 5, operators 5 and 6. I'm going to try final carrier to all modulator ratios of 1 to 2, now with operator 3 at frequency 1 and all the other operators 4, 5 and 6 at frequency 2.
And indeed here it is, a nearly perfect square wave without any strange appearances, neither in the waveform nor in the spectrum. It seems that the waveform which is produced by the first carrier modulator pair, the pair with the final carrier, is preserved, even emphasized, in its character when the following modulators operate at a one-to-one -one ratio with every following, following operator adding higher frequencies. But adding those frequencies with such levels which belong to the basic waveform produced by the final carrier modulator couple. Well, perhaps I'm already a bit too far into column 2, the theory part of this workshop, so let me, here and now, remind you what a one-to-one -one ratio, what a square wave is, a spectrum of all harmonics of the fundamental, meaning that every frequency in the spectrum of the wave produced by operators 4 and 3 is modulated by every harmonic of the fundamental. You'll have a notion already, at least a notion, what's going on behind the scenes, but more about that in column 2 of this and of the following workshop number 3. I would like to prove a practical concept. Every sound, even the strangest, the craziest one, which is created by the pair final carrier first modulator, gets brighter but keeps its character even in an emphasized form, when the following modulators act at a one-to-one -one ratio and with moderate output levels. I choose a frequency of 9.9 .9 for all three modulators. I think we can rightly say the concept is proved. Well, but what about higher amounts of modulation, higher output levels of the modulators? A saw wave ratio first. I increase the output of the modulators at first to 80, then to 90 and at least to 99.
with output levels, modulation amplitudes, of between 66 and 80, the spacing of the partials keeps the same, but their individual amplitudes change remarkably, so that the wave isn't a saw wave anymore. Increasing the output levels even more, to 90 or 99, makes additional partials occur, which don't at all belong to a spectrum of a saw wave. I end up with a machine sound with a lot of noise in it. There is an uncountable number of interesting experiments in this area, with consolation too, but I leave it up to you to play around and try different output levels and different frequency ratios, at least for now. And don't forget about the envelopes. A nice example is the preset orchestra on the ROM cartridge 1A. I turn the output of operator 1 completely down and then gradually the outputs of operators 6, 5 and 4 to discover what every operator in the series contributes to the sound. The carrier, operator 3, is slightly detuned against the modulators, which are completely in tune with each other. All in all we have a saw-like constellation with ratios of 1 to 1. The detuning of the carrier leads to the string's typical phase shift effects. But let me go on to constellation 3 now. Modulating two carriers by the same modulator is basically the same as modulating each of the two carriers by two individual modulators with exactly the same adjustments, the same frequency, the same envelope and so on. The first preset of ROM cartridge 1A, Brass 1, gives us an example. Three carriers, operators 3, 4 and 5, are modulated by the same modulator, operator 6. All three carriers and the modulator are adjusted to approximately the same frequency. They produce a saw wave, therefore, but because the three carriers are slightly detuned against each other and, except of operator 4, also against the modulator, we get the acoustic beats, the slow vibrato typical for brass ensembles. Another nice example is preset number 18 from the same ROM cartridge, Pipes 1. Here, Constellation 3 is used for modulating two different carrier frequencies by the same modulator frequency to get two different ratios, 4 to 10 and 2 to 10, with the same modulation envelope. A very famous example, again from the same ROM cartridge, is preset number 8, Piano 1. Whitney Houston used it a lot in her songs and it was one of her favorites. Not only the differently detuned frequencies of both carriers, operators 4 and 5, which are modulated by the same modulator, but also their different envelopes gives the sound its rich and changing timbre and hammer strong characteristic. We are going to analyze this preset in detail a bit, little bit later in this workshop. Sorry. Let me quickly construct a square wave which blends into a saw wave just one octave higher. I choose algorithm 19 and switch operator 1 off. For the square wave I choose operators 4 and 6 with a well-known ratio of 1 to 2, and for the saw wave I choose operators 5 and 6 with a ratio of 2 to 2, what is the same as 1 to 1, just an octave higher. 
With operator 4, the square wave operator, I adjust levels 2 and 3 to 0 and choose a rate 2 of about 24 and with operator 5 I do the opposite and choose a rate 1 of about 19. I get a square wave slowly transforming into a saw wave one octave up. Constellation 4 now. Modulating a carrier by two different modulators results in a simple addition of the spectra of both individual modulations. This constellation is basically the same as modulating two individual carriers by two individual modulators with both carriers being adjusted to exactly the same parameters. I choose algorithm 10 and turn the output of operator 1 completely down and the output of operator 4 completely up. I increase the frequency of operator 6 to 2. The C to R ratio of operators 4 and 6 is 1 to 2 now. Therefore, turning the output of operator 6 up to about 66 shall show the typical spectrum of a square wave with every second harmonic missing. Well, proved. Of course it does. Increasing the output of operator 5 now shall fill in the gaps in the spectrum as the 1 to 1 ratio of the carrier operator 4 and the modulator operator 5 produces a saw wave with every harmonic present in the spectrum. But because there is really every harmonic present, also those which are already there, those of the square wave, the new harmonics should be less strong than those which are already there and are amplified by the addition of the saw wave. And indeed, exactly that happened. The graph shows the addition of the two spectra. You may have noticed already that we can use this constellation 4 to blend the two waves one into the other as we did with constellation 3, but this time we don't need to change the pitch the octave. What about some old school sci fi effects? Alright, let's change this carrier's frequency to a fixed 100 Hz, tune one of the modulators to a strange frequency, and here we are. Back to serious work and some glimpses at presets. The preset Brass 3 of ROM cartridge 1A makes use of the effect of transforming one modulation into another, simulating the typical way a brass instrument finds its tune. Here we have three modulators, operators 2 and 3, and the chain 6, 5, 4 modulating operator 1 with different envelopes for each modulator. Only one last example how to implement configuration 4 for today. Same ROM cartridge but preset 14, BAS 1. Look at the envelopes of the three direct first order modulators to 3 and 5 to discover which modulation chain is responsible for which part of the sound. Again, a detailed analysis of BESS presets shall be made in column 3 of a later workshop. Scaling. Keyboard scaling. Keyboard rate scaling. 
Keyboard rate scaling lets the envelopes go faster through their stages when you play higher notes and slower when you play lower notes. We can choose 8 different angles from 0 to 7. The higher the number, the steeper the curve, meaning the bigger the difference between higher and lower notes. Let me demonstrate that with the attack of a carrier. We can adjust the keyboard rate scaling of the envelopes individually for every operator, which gives us a lot of flexibility which parameter of a sound shall be to what amount, uh, depend, dependent on uh, the played tone on the keyboard or from your DAW. Just another example, this time I scale the carrier. Keyboard rate scaling doesn't only influence the attack of an envelope, but the whole envelope, of course. Well, keyboard level scaling then. This function is a bit more complex. We can set a breakpoint from where on upwards the right depth and right curve adjustments will be valid and from where on downwards the left depth and left curve adjustments will be valid. And again, we can tweak these parameters individually for every operator, every, every carrier, every modulator. It should be clear, but just in case, well, of course, the breakpoint is independent from the frequency the operators are tuned to. It depends only on the key you hit on the keyboard. I'll demonstrate it in a second, but there is another fact to mention first. The Yamaha DX7, and therefore also the VST DX, doesn't change the scaling from key to key, but in groups of three keys, meaning a certain scaling is valid for the breakpoint and for the next two keys to the right and the next two keys to the left of this breakpoint. Here are some breakpoints, just as a rough orientation. You may set up a complete spreadsheet of your own using the VST's keyboard and your mouse to make sure you hit the keys with exactly the same strength. OK, we have reached column 2 of today's workshop at least. A little bit of FM-PM theory. I told you in our last workshop that the partials in an FM-PM spectrum are called sidebands and that this term comes from radio electronics. Further, we have uh, only worked with sidebands whose frequency was higher than that of the fundamental so far. Those are called upper sidebands. But FM-PM creates sidebands on both sides of the fundamental. There are also lower sidebands. Please watch the example with a carrier frequency of 1000 Hz and a modulator frequency of only 100 Hz. I use algorithm 1 of the VST DX and switch the operators 1 and 2 to fixed frequencies. 
The attack of the modulator output is at maximum to make the side bends occur quite slowly. The side bends indeed occur to both sides of the carrier, and they always occur in pairs, an upper side bend plus a lower side bend at the same time. The difference of the frequencies between the upper side bend and the carrier and the lower side bend and the carrier are equal. Please notice that I have switched the signal analyzer from a log logarithmical to a linear scale. And a strange phenomenon. Once the lower side bands have reached zero, some of the older <laughs> frequencies, including the carrier itself, start changing their intensity. Let me call it the dance of the side bands. Well, time for some explanations. The interval between the carrier and the first pair of side bands, and the interval between two consecutive two neighboring side bands, is also always identical with the frequency of the modulator, in my example 100 Hz. Our discovery leads us to rule 3a of frequency and phase modulation. I promised no mathematics, but I beg your pardon, plus and minus. You will be able to survive plus and minus, I think. Well, but what about those dancing sidebands once the lower spectrum has reached zero? And what about the lower sidebands which should have a negative value according to rule 3a? What is a negative frequency? Sounds like nonsense, doesn't it? Well, a negative frequency is a frequency with a phase shift of 180 degrees. With the sine wave it looks like that. In other words, the first sideband whose frequency is arithmetically negative occurs in the spectrum as a positive frequency of the same number of hertz, but with a phase shift of 180 degrees. We can imagine it as a reflected frequency with the y-axis of the coordinate system as the mirror. In the shown example, the reflected sideband falls against another sideband. But wait a minute, wait a minute, the reflected sideband has undergone a phase shift. The phases of the positive sideband, the yellow one, and the reflected negative sideband, the brown one, are out of alignment by 180 degrees and that should lead to phase cancellation. Hmm. Of course it should. And of course it does. But only if both amplitudes are identical. In our example they are not. The order of the reflected brown sideband is higher and its amplitude is lower than that of the yellow sidebands. So what happens? Well, the amplitude of the yellow sideband decreases by the amount of the brown sideband's amplitude. And yes, you may have already discovered it. By that, the amplitudes of the yellow pair of sidebands are not equal anymore. They are not equal anymore. Amplitudes of sidebands? Hmm. Well, that is one of the sound determining factor. In other words, once the lower sidebands start falling against each other, the changes of the sound while increasing the strength of modulation are not only caused by the ever widening spectrum, the occurrence of more and more sidebands of higher frequencies, but also by the changes of the amplitudes of the sidebands of the, let me say, older generations. We are only one step from explaining, from completely explaining the dance of the sidebands, as I called it some minutes ago. What we know until now would explain why a sideband's amplitude decreases when increasing the modulation strength. It is simply the effect of a reflected sideband of higher order with a phase shift of 180 degrees. But why do the amplitudes of sidebands increase again after a while, after increasing the strength of modulation even more? Well. That's because the amplitude of a sideband doesn't change linearly with the strength of modulation. 
The relationship between the strength of modulation and the amplitude of a sideband follows the so-called Bessel functions. Yeah, Bessel functions, and that is a kind of mathematics I would break my promise if I explained it to you in detail. Even, I have to say, I would like to, as I have studied not only music and philosophy, but also mathematics in my younger days, but, well, perhaps in another workshop or tutorial, but not here in this series. In short, sometimes the amplitude of a sideband decreases when increasing the strength of modulation, and sometimes it increases. And the points where sidebands start decreasing their amplitudes and the points where they start increasing their amplitudes is different for every pair of sidebands. And as this is valid also for reflected sidebands, the whole matter of the amplitudes of sidebands gets extremely complex. But but we can agree on rules 3b and 3c at least. If the frequency of a lower sideband is arithmetically negative, it is reflected into the positive with a phase shift of 180 degrees. If the reflected sideband falls against another arithmetically positive sideband, it decreases the amplitude of this arithmetically positive sideband. I can't help showing an uh, even more impressive dance of the sidebands with two modulators in series. No further explanations will be given, just enjoy the ballad. Let me demonstrate and calculate two examples, two more examples. In both examples, the carrier is not an audible frequency. First example, the carrier's frequency is only one, no, it's only 10 hertz, and the modulator's frequency is 100 hertz. The carrier itself cannot be heard, as 10 hertz is not an audible frequency. We hear only the sidebands, but not the carrier. Here, the shown reflected sidebands don't fall against each other, but build a double peak. In my last example about sidebands, the carrier's frequency is well above 16,000 Hz. The modulator's frequency is 1,000 Hz. Increasing the strength of modulation, the lower sidebands develop down into audible frequencies. Well, 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 it's time to put some structure, some system to the matter. And as there are no special amounts of modulation, <clears throat> I'll use the C to R ratio to find a useful structure. You may remember from workshop 1, there are only those two factors of importance so far. Amount of modulation, strength of modulation and the ratio. Two restrictions, which indeed are no real restrictions, as we will see, for this week's workshop. First, I'm going to use only integer numbers. One, two, three, four, and so on. I wouldn't be able to set up a structure at all otherwise. And I'm going to use only non-reducible ratios. So, for example, two to two gets one to one. Multiplying those 
non-reducible ratios wouldn't change the sound, but only the pitch, as we discovered in workshop 1. Having set up these borders, I can divide the carrier to, um, to modulate a ratio into groups now. I can subdivide these groups later if necessary or useful. All ratios of a group will have one or two common properties. The sounds they produce will be kind of akin. On another channel, Music of the Wall, I called it a genetic analysis of sound. The first rough division to begin with shall read. Group 1. The carrier's frequency is lower than the frequency of the modulator. In short, Fc is smaller than Fm, or even shorter, C is smaller than M. Group 2. The carrier's frequency is equal to the modulators, C equals M. The group has only one member, of course, the member 1 to 1, and we have already met this member quite often in this series. Group 3. The carrier's frequency is higher than the frequency of the modulator. C is bigger than M. But this video is already quite long. Yeah, okay. We did a lot of work in column 1. Let me talk about these groups and their subgroups in the next workshop, therefore. I'd rather want to spend some more time with piano sounds today, and especially with a very famous one. And so I have reached column 3 of today's workshop at last. Piano sounds. Whitney Houston liked a special piano sound very much, and it is used in quite a lot of her songs. It is the preset Piano 1 from ROM Cartridge 1A, so why not starting with this one? By the way, the tune you hear in the background is using this preset. It is an old folk song from the Czech Republic. We have great folk songs here and perhaps someday I'll rework some of them. Well, okay, back to our items. Let's at first find out what the individual carriers and their chains of modulation contribute to the sound. I turn the output levels of operators 4 and 5 down to 0 to get only the chain operator 3, operator 2 and operator 1. Now the carrier operator 4 and its modulator operator 6. And the carrier operator 5 with its modulator operator 6, again 6 at least. And the same again with activated signal analyzers. Chain operator 6 and operator 5 generates the thud of the hammer against the strings of the piano. Therefore, the envelope of the carrier has a very fast attack, rate 1 equals uh, 81, and a fast decay, rate 2 equals 58. 
The effect of this chain is quite small, but you can easily see it when comparing the spectra of the first milliseconds after hitting a key. The upper spectrum is with activated operator, operator 5, the lower spectrum is without. It's quite interesting that the modulation, operator 6, is the same as the modulation of chain operator 6, operator 4, one of the two parts of the body of the sound. So, let's have a detailed look at this modulation before we go on to the two main sound sources. I increase rate 2 to get a better notion of the spectral contents of the sound of the hammer thud. The feedback loop of operator 6 adds some higher frequencies to the sound. I will remove them by turning the feedback down from 6 to 0. And here is it at least. The modulation of the hammer sound. It is bell-like. All sidebands are inharmonic and the reflected lower sidebands are quite near to the upper sidebands. Well, it is of course inharmonic because there is no integer C to M ratio. The ratio reads 1.58 minus a very small amount to 1 minus a very small amount. This means the carrier's frequency is about 1.58 times the modulators. And the thud of the hammer indeed causes a short inharmonic beginning of each piano note. That is one phenomena which are and this is one of the phenomena which are caused by the extremely high tension of piano strings. Here I need to make some small notes about the strings of a piano. They don't swing like the strings of, for example, a guitar, because they are extraordinary me uh, mechanical tension. Um, because of this mechanical tension, their sound is different from a typical string sound. Their tuning is different and their spectrum is different. To make it simple, a single string of a piano sounds slightly out of tune and tuning a piano means, amongst others, to tune the different octaves of the instrument differently, slightly out of tune. Piano players and people who professionally tune pianos may forgive me these simplified explanations. And what's more, only the best notes are produced by single strings. The rest of the notes are produced by two or three strings, which are hit by the same hammer and which are never mathematically exactly in tune. How can we change the hammer thud? Well, we shouldn't change the modulator operator 6, as this operator acts also as the modulator in the chain operator 6 and operator 4. Let me play around with the different frequencies of the carrier of operator 5, then making the decay last a little longer may also lead to useful sounds. Let me leave the hammer thud and the modulation chain operator 6 and operator 5 to go to the parts of the body of the sound. 
I'm going to compare the two chains again. So, I turn down the output of operator 5 to get the sound and spectrum of both chains. Then I turn down the, op uh, the output of operator 4 to get only the three operator chain. And then I turn down the output of operator 1 and pop up the, amount, uh, the output of operator 4 again to get only the chain operator 6 and 4. There are two main differences between both chains. First, the spectrum of chain of the chain operator 3 to 1 contains a couple of higher partials. It reaches higher up the frequency scale. Well, that was predictable as this chain contains a second order modulator operator 3 and what's more, this second order modulator is turned is attuned to a higher frequency f equals 3. Second, the carriers are slightly out of tune. Apart from that, there are the same frequencies in both spectra, well, slightly detuned. This simulates the above-mentioned situation with the two or three strings per note and it changes the effect of alternately amplifying and uh, attenuating the deeper frequencies which are part of both spectra, whereas the higher frequencies stay more or less the same, only influenced by the envelopes of operators 2 and 3, the modulators, and the overall output determined by the carrier's envelope. Let's, uh, let's watch uh, this effect again. In column 1 of this workshop I called it the dance of the sidebands. This dance of the sidebands is basically caused by the changing amplitudes of the reflected lower sidebands falling against the upper sidebands. We talked about it in column 1, but the way of amplifying it and, and uh, attenuating is superposed um, by the phase effects causing by the detuning of both carriers and their sidebands. And don't forget about the Bessel functions. I use two instances of dx now, dx now. The upper spectrum is produced by an instance without detuning of the carriers 1 and 4 against each other. The lower spectrum shows the detuned original preset. Please notice the differences while the note slowly fades away. I want to look at the carrier modulator ratios now. Operators 4 and 6 first. We find a nearly 1 to 1 ratio producing a saw wave-like output. The feedback of the modulator makes the sound brighter, makes the spectrum reaching further up into higher frequencies. The effect of carrier and modulator being slightly out of tune is more visible than it is audible. Please watch the different ways the wave changes while fading when I change the amount by which operator 6 is detuned against operator 4. But at least it contributes to the changing of the overall sound while fading away as it is typical for pianos.
Before looking at the other modulation chain of the body of the sound, I'm going to experiment a little with the modulator's frequency, changing it by, uh, by bigger amounts. With frequencies lower than the carriers, we get a, well, also a nice piano sound, whereas higher frequencies lead us into the realm of bells. Well, I turn the output of operator 4 down and pop up operator 1. The carrier operator 1 is detuned against its first modulator operator 2, a little more than we had it in the chain before, but the main difference is the additional modulator operator 3, which is modulating the modulator 2. Operator 2. We call it a second, or I call it a second order modulator. The effect of this second order modulation is obvious, it adds higher partials to the sound. The C to M ratio of the two modulators is nearly 1 to 3, with operator 2 slightly detuned against a clean 1 to 3 ratio. The effect of operator 1 and operator 2 being detuned against each other is a bit better audible here. The spectra of the detuned version of the carrier modulator couple contains the same sidebands as the version of having a perfect one-to-one -one ratio, but the amplitudes of the individual sidebands are different. But again, it is the development of the waveform that shows the difference between the original detuned version and the version with operator 1 and operator 2 in tune best. The lower wave shows the detuned, uh, detuned version, the upper one is generated by a second instance of de with operator 1 and operator 2 in perfect tune. I'd like to look at the couple operator 2 and operator 3 now. I play around with the frequency of the second order modulator first. The effect of changing the second order modulator's frequency is different from what we got when we did the same with operator 6 in the other chain. We never get bellish sounds, the sounds we get are always still string sounds. With higher frequencies the sound gets like a plucked string, a cembalo instead of a piano. But back to the original nearly 1 to 3 ratio. In workshop 1 we discovered that the clean 1 to 3 ratio produces a spectrum with every third harmonic missing. How does the detuning of operator 2 change this? I reproduce the frequency relationship operator 2 and 3 with the operators 2 and 1 to see the spectrum. Well, no remarkable difference. Let me switch to the waveform. And indeed, the effect is visible now. What we get is a phasing effect. Hm. We should have predicted that, I think. And this wave, this shifting and drifting wave, modulates operator 1 in the original piano pitch. 
Please notice the different scaling of the operators and think about what we have discovered about that in column one of today's workshop. And well, it's done again. I have reached the end of workshop two. Those of you who have registered or will do so can send me their solutions and suggestions um, of homework one and two. Uh, and uh, I will send you a personal comment about your work. The others will have to wait until the next part of this workshop is published in about six weeks. I'm going to show the best or most interesting homeworks at the beginning of the next workshop. You will find more information, material, help and discussions about this workshop on my website www.rofilm-medianet and forum the Deep Sound Divers Coffee House. On the website you will find all graphics and all sound files and spreadsheets and so on of this workshop ready to, do, uh, to be downloaded for free. If uh, you want to register to get personal coaching, even that is for free of course, please visit the contact me page of my website. And, like always, please consider subscribing and liking and, perhaps, if you have enjoyed this workshop, even donating to support my work. Have a great day and a good time. Rolf.